Hello, everybody. I'm Happy Caldwell, and I want to thank you for joining me for today's edition of Arkansas Live. All week, we've been talking about the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God encompasses the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is the earthly sphere of the kingdom of God. So we're going to continue with that revelation today right out of the scriptures. So stay tuned. Arkansas Live starts right now. Let's go back to our scripture text that we have <clears throat> centered up on uh, quite a bit this week. In Matthew 16, uh, verse 19, Jesus told Peter, he said, I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. The literal translation means I'm going to give you the keys of from the heavens. I'm going to show you heaven's operating system, the kingdom from the heavens. Now, heaven's a real place. It's in the northern part of the universe. We learned that uh, this week. Uh, we know we've been given authority and dominion to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. We've been given authority by Jesus to use his name, to lay hands on the sick, cast out devils, raise the dead, cleanse the leper. We know that our authority rests in what Jesus did on the cross. We re realize he's the king of the kingdom. And we exposed an erroneous teaching called kingdom now, which suggests that we, because we have dominion, have to bring every um, kingdom in the earth under our subjection, under our feet for Jesus to be able to come back. That is not true. Uh, the Bible says Jesus will put all things under his feet, not ours. <clears throat> and he will come set up his kingdom during the millennial reign. But what are we supposed to be doing? Let's get it right. Let's get it in, in, in true confirmation with the scriptures. What are we supposed to be doing? This kingdom of heaven has been given to us. Uh, to rule and reign, the sphere of profession. The kingdom of heaven is the earthly sphere of the kingdom of God. And we certainly have authority and dominion in the name of Christ. But in Genesis 1, 26 through 28, when you read that, and we usually use that to um, suggest God created us in his image and likeness, told us to take dominion. But you go back and read what he said, take dominion over. There, there are no politics. There's no government for us to take over. And I, I think that's one thing, and hear me now, and please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm all for Christians in government. I know m many of them, and they've done some great things in our city, state, nation. And But God didn't call you to take over the government. He didn't call the church to take over the government. In uh, Isaiah, it says the, the government shall be upon his shoulders, Jesus, talking about the millennial reign, talking about eternity. Yes, we have to use people in our present government and in our uh, constitutional republic. We have to have people, and we want good people, godly people. Uh, our whole constitution uh, was uh, structured for the propagation of the gospel for a godly people. We realize all of that. History, history proves that, bears it out. But the error is, is when you think that you have to subdue all the kingdoms to yourself under your feet, and only then can Jesus come back and set up his kingdom. Well, Jesus will come back and set up his kingdom when God says to. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what you've got subjugated unto your, your feet. You know, there's two schools of thought, and I've read both of them uh, carefully. There's two schools of thought in, in church world. Uh, one, we have to get into involved, involved in every uh, aspect of our culture, and we have to take it over for Jesus. Take over the government. Take over politics. Take over this. Take over athletics. Take over music. Take over... And then the other side or the other belief is that we just sit by and do nothing 
and just, you know, you hear preachers say that, well, God didn't call me to do that. He called me to preach the gospel. Well, that's true, too. You somehow have to merge the two together and find out where the Holy Spirit <laughs> wants you and what he wants you to to be involved in. But get this idea out of your head. Uh, the kingdom now uh, theology is skewed to, to think that you're going to have to take over everything before Jesus can come back. No, he, the government will be on his shoulder. He'll take it back. What are we doing right now? What's our place? Our place is to learn the system of heaven. Jesus told Peter, he said, upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So that means Satan cannot destroy the church. James says he's looking for somebody to devour and it doesn't need to be you. It doesn't need to be me. Uh, you just tell him, no, I'm, I'm not devourable. <laughs> Go somewhere else. Uh, go down the street. I hear they're believing for you to cause trouble uh, for them. <clears throat> a strategy is a system. It is a system of operation. It's a way of doing things. This is the keys, the kingdom of heaven. The keys from the kingdom. Heaven is a real place. But the system of heaven, I mean, the keys of the heaven, the key, keys of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven is a system. Heaven's a real place. This is in the northern part of the universe. But the system is what we're interested. It's a way of doing things. It includes what you ultimately hope to accomplish. A system produces the results that you desire. Systems are utilized in Armies, ministries, corporations, FedEx, McDonald's, they all have systems. Uh, they have plans, goals, products. They're, they're the result of their systems. The kingdom of heaven operates according to systems and strategies, ways of doing things. I learned this... Uh, I guess uh, it was more Im imparted to me and enlarged when I was invited to attend a strategic leadership conference in uh, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania at the U.S. Army War College. And I keep sharing this because it's, it makes a powerful point. Uh, they invited CEOs from all across America. I was invited because of VTN. They didn't know I was a pastor. And... Um, they taught us how the Confederates, how the South and the North fought the war at Gettysburg. Gettysburg was the turning point in the war. That Gettysburg was really where the South lost the war. Um, their strategy. Now, strategy is not just getting from point A to point B. That's tactics. But strategy is what do you hope to accomplish? What is your what is your goal? What, what are you after? What's your purpose? The South's strategy, purpose, was to somehow win the Battle of Gettysburg and psychologically imprint the North that they could not win the war and that they would retreat and the South would march all the way to Washington, D.C. Well, it didn't happen because the South was not prepared. Communication was not what it should have been. They didn't know at Gettysburg that the North had re, uh, re uh, uh, and filtered their staff and their um, their soldiers. They had rearmed. They had new ammunition, new troops, everything up on Cemetery Ridge. And when the, the Confederates came out of the the woodland, the the North just mowed them down. So their their tactic and their strategy was off. They did not win the Battle of Gettysburg for different and various reasons. Therefore, their strategy to psychologically imprint the North did not work. But the strategy is a, a system. It's the way of doing things. And as Christians, we should have strategies that come from the Word of God. And as Christians... We have to know that we have switched kingdoms 
but we have failed to switch systems. We keep doing the same things over and over and over. And let me just tell you how important it is for you to have a firm foundation and good doctrine. I hear it all the time. And it begins to wear on you after a while. I hear it over and over. This one says this. This one says that. Uh, the extreme God's sovereignty. Uh, God is sovereign and everything that happens to you is the will of God. Romans eight twenty eight. Everything that happens to you uh, is for your good and it will work out okay. And, it'll come. and Calvinism, fatalism, whatever God, you know, wants to do. And he's already predestined your life and uh, everything in it. All of that weakens you. I, I've heard people say, and these are knowledgeable Bible teachers, but because of their experience and what they've experienced and the challenges that they've had and the obstacles that they've had, they think that it's God's will for them to have all that and that these incidences in their life are training periods. What one uh, minister I heard said, well, if I hadn't experienced all the things that I experienced in my life, I wouldn't be where I am now. And, the, and a lot of them use the story of Joseph, you know. Well, look at Joseph. Joseph did this. Joseph was sold into slavery. Joseph was accused of adultery. Joseph was accused of rape. Joseph was accused of, and look where God took him. And they read that scripture. <laughs> they read that scripture in Genesis uh, about uh, Joseph. In fact, let's go over there. I know some of you get tired of hearing this, but eventually the Holy Ghost is going to give you a revelation uh, uh, of what this means. Genesis chapter 50. Genesis chapter 50. I, I enjoy and love the, the testimony of Joseph and the, the story of Joseph. But let's, let's get it right. Genesis chapter well, where did my Genesis go? <laughs> it's in here. It's in here somewhere. There it is. Genesis chapter 50. And uh, uh, verse 19. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, talk to his brothers, his family, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. And I've taught this so many times. You go back and you read Genesis 45 all the way up to 50, and you find out what Joseph went through. And most people think, and I've heard it taught so many times, uh, you, he talked to his brothers, you meant what you did to me for evil. Uh, they were going to kill him. Reuben said, no, let's just sell him. Uh, <laughs> You meant evil against me, but God meant it. And we read into this what's not there. God meant the evil for my good. That is diametrically, spiritually, biblically backwards, wrong, not God's DNA, not biblically correct. God does not use evil for anything. James 1.13 said, let no man say when he's tempted of God, he's tempted of evil because God cannot be tempted with evil. Evil is not in God's DNA, but that's the way we've read it. You meant evil against me, but God meant the evil for good. Not true. To bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. One day I read that and I said, okay, God, I want you to explain that to me. And God said, define it. What is it? <laughs> he said the it that is referred to is the dream what did God mean for good? The dream. That's what saved Egypt. That's what saved the Israelites in the land of Goshen. Everything that Joseph experienced that was good for a nation. And it tells you those three things. He saved many people alive. He preserved a remnant. All of that that happened as a result of Joseph's obedience to the dream. Let's read it that way. And Joseph said to them, fear not, for I am in the place of God. Yes, am I where I told you I'd be? Is that, am I experiencing what the dream said? Yes. But as for you, you thought evil against me. God said, change the, the understanding of evil to it. But it, what's it? The dream. 
you thought evil against me, but God meant the dream unto good. I'm not changing the Bible, changing the understanding of that verse when God said it's the dream, not the evil. And yet I hear all the time people say, oh, well, look at Joseph. Look what God did for him. He went through all kinds of hell, went to prison, accused of this, blah, blah, blah. And so therefore, if I'm experiencing all of this stuff, then God's going to work the evil out for my good. No, he's not. You're going to be deceived and you're going to be duped and you're going to believe Calvinism, fatalism, that everything that happens to you is good and God and you're going to be defeated eventually. So plug into the heavenly system, the kingdom of heaven, a system, a system from God that gives you the results that you desire. Let's go to Second um, Peter. I'm going to kind of skip over some things here. Let's go to Second uh, Peter chapter one and verse three. Second Peter chapter one, uh, excuse me, sec, yeah, Second Peter chapter one and verse three. Well, I was going to say two, but let's go to three. Second uh, Peter chapter one, verse three. Second Peter chapter one. Here it is. Let's go to verse two. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. So God has already done this. He has already given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, hereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. That's almost unbelievable, but it's there in the Bible that you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in this world through lust. And besides giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue, knowledge, knowledge, temperance, temperance, patience, faith, godliness, and godliness, brotherly kindness, and brotherly kindness, charity. If these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall not be barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, everything that we'll ever have need of, he's already given to us. All these things he has given to us. This is the grace of God. This is the legal side of redemption. It's already done. And what Jesus was telling Peter, he was saying, okay, um, I'm going to give you the keys. I'm going to show you how the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven operates. I'm going to give you the operating system of heaven. You take what God has already given you. You take what God has already given you. Everything that pertains to life and godliness. He, he didn't give you trouble. He didn't give you heartache. He didn't give you sickness, disease. He didn't give you the devil to torment you. He gave you everything that pertains to life and godliness. Now, as Christians, we might understand we're no longer in the kingdom of darkness. We're in the kingdom of God's dear son, the kingdom of light. We've switched kingdoms but we haven't yet switched systems. The systems of the kingdom of heaven is whatever you say is what you're going to have. Uh, the systems of the kingdom of heaven is, uh, and we'll read it in, in either today or tomorrow, in Isaiah, come up here, my ways are higher than your ways. The systems are whatever you bind on earth 
bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth, loosed in heaven. God's got you back. He's going to take care of you. Whatever you say, whatever you say, Mark eleven twenty three. whatever you say, he that says to the mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast to the sea, doesn't doubt in his heart, but believe those things which he saith shall come to pass. He'll have whatever he says. That's the system of the kingdom of heaven. It's, a, it's the sphere of profession. Now, let's go back to Colossians. Colossians chapter 1. And let's look at verses 12 and 13. Giving thanks to the Father, which hath made us. Did you get it? He's already done this. Hath made us. He has made us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. In Peter, it says he's made us partake of God's divine nature. We are partakers of God's divine nature. I know that sounds almost blasphemous. How can we partake of God's divine nature? Because he's made us. He's made us righteous. He's through Christ now. You understand that everything's through Jesus. He's made us righteous. He's given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. So he says, give thanks unto the Father, which hath made us fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us. Here it is again, past tense. Hath delivered us. He's already done this hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. So we've been translated. We've been <clears throat> made righteous. We've been partakers of his divine nature. We, we, we are partakers of his inheritance. It's a past tense. It's already done. It's the grace of God. It's which God's already done for us. It's the legal side of redemption. It's what God says, I've already done this for you. It's a done deal. So we've been translated. We have been switched to different kingdoms. We've been translated out of the king, kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son, but we have failed to switch systems. We haven't changed our way of thinking. Go over to Isaiah chapter 55. And this is not easy, but it's, it's, it's necessary. <clears throat> it's expedient that we do this. Isaiah chapter 55. And let's look at verse 8. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and returns not thither but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be <laughs> that goes forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the things whereunto I sent it. Now he says for us to come up to his way of thinking. Come up to my way of thinking. My way of thinking is higher than your way of thinking. Oh, neither are your ways my ways. So we've got to change systems. We've got to change the way we think. We've got to change what we believe. We have to change our strategy, our authority to implement the heavenly system comes from our relationship and revelation of Christ and the fact that we reign with him. Wow. I, this is a daily Quest. This is a daily reminder. Our authority to implement the heavenly system comes from our relationship with him and the revelation of the word. And if you have the, the, the biblical doctrines, you won't get off. 
into kingdom now. You won't get off into dominionism. You won't get off into reconstructionism. You won't get off into those extremes. You won't get off into Calvinism and fatalism. That every little thing that happens to you is the will of God. It's not true. That's not what the Bible teaches. Even Job, who most people have never read the book of Job. They've just heard pieces quoted. Poor old Job. He wasn't poor. He owned two thirds of the known world. (laughs) <laughs> you just have to move over Job and let me sit down beside you I've got troubles <laughs> heartaches by the number and troubles by the score old country uh, lying cheating song and we, we don't realize we've been given all things that pertain to life and godliness sickness does not pertain to life and godliness depression does not pertain to life and godliness uh, poverty doesn't pertain to life and godliness so God didn't give us any of those things and I I guess you know I I attended a church when I was a kid I grew up in that particular church where they taught a strong message of predestination predestination predetermined and I hear this all the time Uh, if if you're a child of God and I and I know they're saying it to encourage people God, uh, God's got a plan for your life. Your life was already planned out from the time you were born. Predestined. Oh, man. You don't even know what predestined means. It wasn't your life that was predestined. That's not what God said in Jeremiah. He said, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. He didn't say your whole life is planned out. Predestined pre-planned had to do with the plan of salvation. That was what was predestined. That's what was pre-planned. Your salvation is made available. It was pre-designed by God that whosoever will can be saved. But your life is yours to live. You remember that. Now, show me tomorrow, one more day, and we're going to continue this on the kingdom of heaven. Remember, Jesus is Lord of Arkansas and where you're watching too. Send your questions, comments, and testimonies to Happy Caldwell at Post Office Box 26207, Little Rock, Arkansas 72221 or email happycaldwell at vtntv.com. Remember to follow VTN on Facebook at VTN Your Arkansas Christian Connection. And follow Happy Caldwell on Twitter at Happy underscore Caldwell. VTN is on Roku. Search VTN in the channel store and add us to your lineup. Today's episode is available to watch on demand at VTNTV.com and click watch. You can also watch VTN via live stream at VTNTV.com.